as we are joined by Anthony Markham, a fellow for the Governance Project at the R Street Institute, online at the letter R, the word street dot org, R Street dot org. Anthony, good evening. Evening. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you on here. And so we're told that it's uh, likely uh, to be, in fact, I guess the president went past likely, it will be a woman. So uh, what uh, do you uh, think about uh, the various names that are being uh, bandied about, such as uh, Amy Coney Barrett, among others? Are we... Would you would you take a second shot at that, please, Anthony? I'm sorry, the line was bad there. No problem. Can you hear me now, Jim? Yeah, just fine. All right. So, so uh, um, as, as we know, President Trump has released several versions of his list. The names have increased, most recently adding 20 more names to that list. But recent reporting tells us really it's probably down to just two. Amy Coney Barrett, as you mentioned, and Barbara Lagoa, a circuit court judge out of Miami, Florida. Um, judge Barrett has been a favorite for several years. She was reportedly in the mix for the seat that ultimately went to Justice Kavanaugh. So between those two, most likely, we'll know, as reporting suggests, probably by this weekend. Uh, interesting indeed. Uh, I suppose the uh, idea would be, uh, and since obviously uh, political calculations have to to be uh, big in this entire process, since this is what this has become now, a, uh, has become a, 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 a political process of gathering votes, just as you would on some... Uh, appropriations bill laden with pork, uh, uh, I suppose that uh, a woman on the list uh, would uh, presumably uh, be aimed at uh, making it easier for uh, Republican senators uh, to stick together and all vote for confirmation. I think that's fair to say, and I think one of the main reasons is, of course, the person who um, is going to be filling the seat is going to be replacing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was uh, an icon on the Supreme Court. Whether you agreed with her or disagreed with her, her um, her stance and inspire inspiration for millions of women across the United States is important. And of course, I think it's uh, the political calculus to replace her with a woman as well, not only to make it palatable for senators, but for voters and millions of Americans as well. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh uh, one thing also to be said uh, for Barrett, I'm not sure exactly when uh, uh, the uh, other uh, uh, nominee w had become a judge, but Barrett, I know, was just approved by this very same Senate late last year. And so it's not likely that anything that they could uh, could have dredged up at the time, there'd be nothing new out there. In other words, they've already said yes, and by a, a fairly good margin, I think it was 55 to 43 for a seat on an appeals court, and uh uh, so uh, it, it would, I presume, put some pressure on, on Democratic senators. Uh, clearly, they're going to vote as a block. I think there's no question about that, and the stakes are higher. But the pressure would be there for them to say, okay, you just got through confirming her for the second most important level of the U.S. judiciary. Why are you voting no now? Uh, I guess that's, that's how the logic goes, and I, I can't argue with it, I suppose. I think that's exactly how the logic would be. I think for both Judge Barrett and both Judge um, and uh, and both Judge uh, Lagoa, the, they're both incredibly young nominees. They both have impressive legal credentials. They both serve on the circuit court, not for a long, very long time. Um, Justice Lagoa or Judge Lagoa, just for a year or so. Judge Barrett, just for a little bit longer. Um, Judge Barrett's 52. Judge Log Lagoa is 48. They would both be incredibly young justices and nominees. Um, they both would only be the fifth woman in Supreme Court history to serve. And so I, I think they, they check a lot of boxes, and I think it would be difficult um, for the votes to swing. For Judge Lagoa, for example, the vote was overwhelmingly bipartisan for her circuit court position. Is that going to be the same if she were nominated for the Supreme Court? Obviously not. But I think it's one of the many arguments Republicans can use, can use to throw uh, out allegations of hypocrisy just as Democrats have thrown back at them. And so uh, assuming if you've got a 53 to 47 split, and of course uh, Mike Pence, the vice president, standing by as a tiebreaker if it comes down to that. So that means that the Democrats could lose three of their 53, which would put it down to 50-50, in which case uh, Pence uh, casts the tiebreaker. Uh, if they, they get it uh, below that to 49 to 51, then uh, the game is over. Uh, and I guess that's the big issue. 
who is wavering. Now, do we definitely have Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Susan Collins of Maine in the no column for a nomination before the election? I think that's fair to say. I think their I think their comments that they released over the weekend, you know, offered some vagaries and 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 not certainties, but I think enough to suggest that they would not support voting for a nominee before the election. After the election, especially if President Trump were to win, I think that's a completely different story. So if with two gone, as you mentioned, there are 53, you would need two to get under that magic 50 mark. It doesn't seem like any senators are wavering yet other than those two. Of course, Senator Romney said he would probably have more thoughts after a GOP lunch tomorrow. We know Senator Grassley and Senators Lee, for example, have released statements saying that they support voting for a nominee before the election. So the numbers are dwindling on which senators could possibly flip along with Senator Collins and Murkowski. Yeah. Uh, I am told that there have been, in presidential years, 29 Supreme Court vacancies in our history, and that every single president made a nomination, every single one, Republicans, Democrats, I'm sure there may be some Whigs on the list if you go back far enough. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's not all. There, there are also uh, some other things. I would like to quote a couple of people here that I think are important. Here's one quote. When there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court, the president is to nominate someone. The Senate is to consider that nomination. There is no unwritten law that says that it can only be done on off years. That is not in the Constitution text. Unquote Barack Obama 2016. And then there is the quote that is attributed to uh, uh, this individual here. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the president stopped being the president in the last year. And as for whether the Senate should take up a vote, uh, Ginsburg, uh, this was who it is, it was, it was RBG herself, said that's their job. So, I mean, th- th- this whole notion of how it's so, so wrong, I mean, AOC, who's never been known as a rocket scientist on matters constitutional, suggests it would be an impeachable offense for the president to do what the Constitution clearly and explicitly empowers him to do. Uh, honestly, I thought it was, it was a little bit bogus when Mitch McConnell uh, four years ago uh, torpedoed the Garland vote. And uh, frankly, I just, to me, just hold the vote. Uh, this notion that, that somehow uh, it, it is a proper game for politics strikes me as, uh, as frankly lame. Your thoughts? Well, I'll say this. I think there's definitely a difference between could and should. Can for the president nominate a nominee? Can the Senate confirm that nominee? Absolutely. When it goes, go back to 2016 and Merrick Garland, the Senate was well within its rights not to consider a nominee. They don't have to hear it. They don't have to put the nominee before committee. They don't have to vote on the nominee. All those things are permitted. And, of course, none of those things are a impeachable offense. It's not an impeachable offense for following the Constitution. Of course. Not yet, anyway. Of, <laughs> not yet. And then you get into the concern of should. In 2016, you know, we, we saw that the holding Mary Garland enraged Democrats, kind of was the next step of the so-called judicial confirmation war. war. We saw an escalation of that during the contentious Gorsuch and Kavanaugh hearings. And I'm sure whatever form these next hearings take, it's probably going to get even worse. If Democrats were to take control of the Senate in 2021 or in the future, they're proposing a number of, I would argue, radical reforms. Is that the next step? Would Republicans respond in kind? So that's why I think sometimes I think the politicians need to take a step back, look at the institutional problems and concerns this is actually causing, and try to separate that could versus should be. But one of the issues, and of course, and I think as you mentioned, the fear of an issue like Bush v. Gore coming to a Supreme Court that doesn't have a non-number, where you might run into the case of a 4-4 decision. That would probably be the worst-case scenario where the court is deadlocked. We don't know what's going to happen next. Of course, a 5-4 court could determine that. We could actually have an answer one way or another. Of course, the fear and concern and frustration with many is that final vote would probably then be from a justice that was um, nominated by the president and confirmed just before Election Day. But that might be the consequence of getting a 5-4 answer that we might need. An election day, you know, for the sake of bipartisanship and having an answer to an election we can hope we have confidence in, let's hope not. Let's indeed uh, absolutely hope not. Uh, on, on that subject, uh, we should note 
that uh, the uh, 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 Electoral College is to meet in their respective state capitals uh, on uh, the uh, the first Monday after the second Wednesday of uh, December, which is the 14th, I believe, uh, and uh, which I think is set by statute. Uh, the 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 term of this president ends at 12 noon on January the 20th, and that's in the Constitution. So there are are situations in which we uh, are absolutely <laughs> facing some kind of deadlock in terms of time. I would would certainly hope that we don't press either deadline. I would hope that by let's say the end of uh, of the uh, the first week of November that we have a pretty good idea who won. But I'm not even sure that's true. Hey, let's let's hope so. And of course, you see a lot of reports, of, especially because of this year with the COVID nineteen pandemic, an increased reliance on voting by mail. A lot of states saying that they're perhaps not ready, or they're going to take much more time to count votes. You're not going to get the certainty on election night that uh, you have in past elections. You could have all sorts of ambiguity and problems, potential legal disputes. But as you said, there are some firm, definitive deadlines. And it's important for states to be able to meet those deadlines and to, for voters themselves to get answers beforehand. In short, there are a lot of messes, and unfortunately it seems like the perfect ending for this 2020 story. Are you uh, familiar with how Lyndon Johnson got his nickname, Landslide Lyndon? Vaguely familiar, yes. Yeah, I, can, I can give you the basic rundown of this, uh, and this did not involve mail-in voting, but, but clearly uh, the same problems could arise. Uh, in 1948, Congressman Lyndon Johnson challenged Coke Stevenson, the governor of Texas, for the U.S. Senate seat that was up in Texas. And uh, uh, it uh, turned out that uh, Lyndon by the initial count, was just a hair short. And suddenly in one community, a lot of extra votes turned up, and they were all for, for Lyndon, and uh, he wound up winning by 87 votes. And that nickname, of course, Landslide Lyndon, stayed with him for uh, much of his career, although people tended to forget why. The most interesting thing about the vote in question was the fact that it turned out that the people uh, whose ballots had not been initially counted who voted for Lyndon, uh, they uh, they all voted uh, in the same handwriting in alphabetical order. What are the odds? Anyway, I want to come back and talk a little bit about the reason why we may need a Supreme Court to full in a moment. Jimbo Hannah Show at 186650 Jimbo 186 We've come to this that we can look at Supreme Court nominees, potential nominees, on the basis of how many electoral votes they might deliver. Here's another thing for us to consider, uh, Anthony Markham of the R Street Institute, and that is this there are 35 Senate seats up in November, 23 Republican seats, 12 Democratic seats. Democrats were on the other end of the uh, situation back in 2018, and of course it's hard to defend a whole lot of seats, and they didn't. Their margin in the Senate, uh, uh, the margin of Republicans actually increased slightly. Uh, many many say that uh, the, the Democrats very much have a shot at capturing a majority of the Senate, and of course it would be a new Senate that would handle uh, any uh, uh, new Supreme Court nomination should the current one that is forthcoming uh, fail to make it. But uh, even beyond that, uh, I don't think that anybody is going to be judging any of those Democrats, those uh, 12 Democrats, up for re-election based on, on how they vote, They unless, of course, some of them actually vote for the the president's choice, and I think that is extremely unlikely. But virtually every incumbent Republican senator up for re-election, 23 of them, will be judged on how they vote. And so I could easily see a circumstance in which, let's say, uh, oh, uh, Martha McSally in Arizona, for example, let's say that she tightens the polls there. She's losing in, in most of the most recent polls, but let's say that she votes with the president, and uh, that turns out to, to, to cost her her seat. I could see implications on control of the Senate coming out of this Supreme Court battle. Would you uh, concur, I Anthony? I think that's exactly right, and I think one of the very, very interesting questions, if um, 
is it worth gaining an additional seat on the Supreme Court for a potential set law? And that's not necessarily what have to make, but there are a lot of voters in a lot of these swing states that are looking very closely at what their senator will do. Not only do you have Martha McSally in Arizona in a very difficult race, you have Cory Gardner, Joni Earth, Susan Collins, Tom Tillis, and all over the country in really, really difficult races as Republican incumbents with their with their opponents campaigning heavily against us now. And of course, if there's going to be a confirmation battle, they're not going to be on the campaign trail. They're going to be in Washington. Yeah, uh, another factor that I hadn't even thought about uh, about adding into to all of this. Let me ask you some thoughts about uh, uh, potential uh, uh, changes to the Supreme Court. Of course, the, the Democrats are already talking about something that the Democrats were talking about back in the 1930s, which didn't turn out too well, and that was, of course, Franklin Roosevelt, who was very upset that a lot of his New Deal programs were being threatened by the Supreme Court, wanted to pack the court, which proved to be extremely unpopular and uh, and never actually happened. But, of course, uh, that's that's open uh, we should keep in mind that, that there's no set number of people on the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, so technically, uh, you could add extra seats, just as Chuck Schumer is now talking about doing. Your thoughts about the political advisability of that? Well, I think I think it's one, um, it's an idea that was seen as, I think, extreme only a couple of years ago. That is something that has gained more recognition, more prominence, and frighteningly enough, more support. Yeah, and, and you're right. The, the Constitution says num- nothing about how many members of the Supreme Court there are. When the Supreme Court first started, there were six members. At one point, it went up to ten. It's been at nine for over 150 years. It's one of the longest traditions and most stable parts of our institution we have. Parts of expanding, and I argue, are dangerous. And look at the common sense. If Democrats were to expand it to 11, why aren't Republicans going to expand it to 13 and so on until you get a ridiculous number? And in a court that people have very, very little faith in. And so I think it's, a, I think it's an extreme argument. I think it's a dangerous one, not only for the political ramifications for it, just the feasibility of it all and all the downstream effects that it really has on politics and our rule of law. But think what it could do for all the politically correct people out there. Wow, you could have uh, your black seats, your Latina seats, your woman seats. Uh, we could go back to... Uh, 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 Brandeis uh, and, and a Jewish seat on the court, which uh, has uh, ceased to be there. Heck, we could throw in a, a, a Muslim seat, uh, uh, a uh, a gay seat. I mean, we could have a, a seat for every single group. Wouldn't that be special? Well, I think one of the things I would argue is so often one of my frustrations being Congress doesn't legislate. Well, we could just make a 100 Supreme Court seats and make that the new Senate. Well, that's certainly the way some people obviously view it. Again, uh, one of the uh, the female members of, of the court, Sotomayor or, or uh, Ginsburg, once referred in one of their arguments, uh, uh, not arguments, but in their uh, their opinions, uh, to something being beneficial. And it just struck me. Beneficial is none of your business. You are supposed to be government's umpires calling balls and strikes. That's constitutional. That's not constitutional. If you're worried about beneficial, resign from the court and run for the House, the Senate, or the presidency and see if your idea of beneficial coincides with that of the public. Uh, Not likely to happen, unfortunately, but it ought to, uh, for what it's worth. Your thoughts? Well, I think think it's one of the... the arguments conservatives have made for such a long time is that there's a clear line between judicial decision-making and legislative or political decision-making. And sometimes that line is difficult, but it should be obvious enough where the court is not going to make its own law. It's going to interpret the laws that it's given. And of course, some laws are dumb, and but you still have to enforce those laws. And so I think Justice Scalia was the one who famously said if he would wish he would have had a stamp that said stupid but legal. And that's really the and that's really the process that judges make compared to legislators. 